Hi, hope you're all doing good. In this video, let's discuss the following topics starting with the number of radiographs in full mouth survey. So as you can see, we have 17 IOPAs and 4 bite wings. So the total is 17 plus 4, 21. Right now, moving on to the next question pleomorphic adenoma. We already discussed the same prior in the form of a gene. So, also, there seems to be a question on pleomorphic adenoma is most commonly seen in which of the following salivary glands. So, as you're all familiar with, it is parotid gland. Pleomorphic adenoma is a benign neoplasm consisting of cells exhibiting the ability to differentiate to epithelial and mesenchymal cells. Pleomorphic adenoma is the most common tumor of salivary glands. The parotid gland is the most common site of pleomorphic adenoma. Right? Moving on to the next question. There seems to be a case-based question from John Days. So do refer the following literature and see if it is helpful in answering your question. So as you can see, we have different types of jaundice, hemolytic, hepatic and obstructive. In case of hemolytic, you can see there is elevation in serum unconjugated bilirubin, increased excretion of urobilinogen in urine and dark brown color of feces due to high content of stercobilinogen. And in case of hepatic jaundice, you can see there is increased levels of conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin in serum dark colored urine due to excess excretion of bilirubin and urobilinogen increased activities of alanine transaminase and aspartate transaminase released in circulation due to damage to hepatocytes and also the patients pass pale clay colored stools due to absence of stercobilinogen and coming to obstructive jaundice, we have the following findings increased concentration of conjugated bilirubin in serum Serum alkaline phosphatase is elevated as it is released from cells of damaged bile duct. Dark colored urine due to elevated excretion of bilirubin and clay colored feces due to absence of stercobilinogen. And feces contain excessive fat indicating impairment in fat digestion and absorption in the absence of bile. Right. Also, the patients experience nausea and gastrointestinal pain. So these are some of the findings relevant to different types of jaundice. See if that's helpful in answering your question. Now, moving on to the next question, ptosis, as you know, drooping of eyelid. There are different causes for ptosis. Neurogenic cause is one among them. So third nerve palsy and Horner syndrome are the important causes of neurogenic ptosis. Third nerve palsy can result from vascular or inflammatory or neurotoxic or compressive etiology. It presents with ptosis, extraocular muscle involvement sparing the lateral rectus and superior oblique, down and out eyeball and with or without pupillary involvement that is midriasis. See if this information is helpful in answering the question. Now moving on to the next question, typhoid ulcer. So as you can see, we have some literature pertaining to the same. So typhoid fever and paratyphoid fever is a systemic infection caused by Salmonella enterica, including Salmonella enterica serotype typhi and serotype paratyphi. Enteric fever is a fecal oral transmissible disease and thus occurs in an environment with overcrowding, poor sanitation and untreated water. Intestinal bleeding in typhoid fever usually occurs from the ulcers in the ileum or the proximal colon and the most common colonoscopic manifestations are multiple variable sized punched out ulcerations and the shape of the ulcers is usually ovoid with the longest diameter parallel to long axis of gut so that stricture formation doesn't occur after healing. The edges are soft, swollen, irregular but not undermined. The floor is usually smooth and is formed by muscular coat. Near the ileocecal valve where perforation occurs more commonly, ulcers become deeper than elsewhere. All the uncommon sporadic cases of typhoid fever still occur. Now let's move on to the next question, a lipoma, there seems to be a case based question as you know slip sign is characteristic of lipoma. Let's review some literature. A characteristic slippage sign may be elicited by gently sliding the fingers of the edge of the tumor. The tumor will be felt to slip out from under as opposed to a sebaceous cyst or an abscess that is tethered by surrounding induration and also you can see the clinical appearance of lipoma. Now let's move on to the next question, a Valsalva maneuver. I'm sure you're all familiar with the same. So anterior vibrating line, which is an imaginary line lying at the junction between the immobile tissues or hard palate and slightly mobile tissues of soft palate. It can be located by asking the patient to perform the Valsalva maneuver. 
It can also be used by asking the patient to say a ah, in short vigorous burst. So what is this Valsalva maneuver? The patient is asked to close his or her nostrils firmly and gently blowing through his nose. The anterior vibrating line is cupid's bow shaped as you can see. Right. Moving on to the next question. Again, there seems to be a case-based question pertaining to mumps, which is a viral infection caused by paramyxovirus. So, mumps is a viral illness caused by paramyxovirus along with the following information. As you know, it's an acute systemic contagious viral infection which is characterized by painful swelling of one or both parotid glands. It can also involve other salivary glands, meninges, pancreas and gonads. Orchitis developing in association with mumps is a universally recognized complication of mumps. It manifests a few days after the appearance of parotid swelling but occasionally may precede it and rarely may present even without the parotid swelling. Mumps associated with orchitis results in severe pain, swelling and tenderness at the affected site and is often associated with high fever, nausea, vomiting and abdominal pain. It results over a week though gonadal tenderness may persist for a long time. The possibility of sterility occurring in males lends particular interest as this is the most serious complication of mumps syndrome. Frequency of occurrence of orchitis varies with age and with each epidemic bout. Right? So keep this additional information in mind. Uh, in fact, we have discussed various keywords which were given in the question like fever, pain in parotid region, swelling in gonadal region. So based on these keywords, so you can make out the answer. So it is viral based infection caused by paramyxovirus and we are talking about mumps infection. Right? I hope it's clear. Now let's move on to the next question. Hydrated cyst again this seems to be a case based question about a person spending most of his or her time with dog so what kind of infection he could be suffering from based on some uh, features which were given in the question like swelling in the region of liver so I'm not sure what the keywords are but based on what information I received uh, here is some information so hydrated tape form. As you know, it appears as an encapsulated translucent cyst and most hydrated cysts affecting humans grow in liver. The hydrated tapeworm life cycle requires two host animals for its survival. One, hydrated occurs as a small tapeworm in the intestine of dogs or other animals like dingoes or even foxes. These are known as definitive hosts. Hydrates also occur as watery cysts in soft tissues of sheep, cattle, pigs and occasionally man. So rabbits do not act as intermediate hosts for true hydrates, that is echinococcus granulosus. In humans, hydrated cysts can cause serious illness and even death. So this is some information pertaining to hydrated cysts. I hope it's helpful. Now moving on to the final question in this video. We have different modes of health communication as you can see. So panel discussion is one such. In a panel discussion, 4 to 8 persons who are qualified to talk about the topic sit and discuss a given problem or the topic in front of a large group or audience. The panel comprises a chairman or moderator and from 4 to 8 speakers. The chairman opens the meeting, welcomes the group and introduces the panel speakers, introduces the topic briefly and invites the panel speakers to present their points of view. Panel discussion can be an extremely effective method of education provided it is properly planned and guided. So you can find additional information here and also you can find additional information about workshops, role playing, conferences, seminars, chalk and talk lectures, demonstrations, etc. Right. So these are some of the topics which I wanted to highlight in this specific video so do let me know if you need any additional information i'll update them accordingly in the description part of the video i hope it's clear wish you all the best love you all